David Hayes received his BA in English from Kenyon College in 1992 and his PhD from the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago with a dissertation on early Greek lyric poetry. He came to Bard College Berlin as a fellow in 2005. His general teaching interests are poetry, Greek philosophy and literature. At Bard College Berlin, he has taught the core courses and other modules ranging from the Odyssey, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, Poetry and Philosophy, Short Dialogues with Plato. For the last two years, he has been a visiting research fellow in the Institute for Value Studies at the University of Winchester and is happy to be returning to teach at BCB this coming fall. And we are happy to have him back. Um, today, Let's play that back. Can I give you an extra A? <laughs> everyone, everyone gets extra A. Okay. <laughs> today, in a lecture titled The Future of Archaic Greek Education, with reference to Nietzsche's On the Advantage and Disadvantage of History for Life, he will be talking to us of archaic Greek education before its institutionalization with Plato and Aristotle. What might we take from this model of education to enliven the 21st century Lebanon's college? That's going to be our question throughout his lecture. I will also introduce our second speaker, uh, Michael Weinman. Michael Weinman is a professor of philosophy at Bard College Berlin since 2013. After originally arriving as a guest professor in 2010, he is the author of three books, most recently The Parthenon and Liberal Education, an investigation of the Parthenon as an education in the liberal arts, co-authored with Bard College Berlin faculty member Jeff Lehman, and we will be having a presentation on that book tonight. Join us. Um, at Bard College Berlin, He, taught, he teaches the core courses and across modules ranging from freedom of expression, nationalism, constitutions, and truth in action. Through, um, through a reading of Hannah Arendt's Crisis in Education with and against Nietzsche's thought on the institutions of the progressive liberal state, today he will help us reflect on liberal education's defensive position in the United States and how to maintain and extend the strides of the Humboldtian program in a lecture titled Our Educational Institutions Between Past and Future, The Crisis of Education as a Crisis of Authority. Join me in welcoming David and Michael. So first I want to thank the conference organizers for the kind invitation to talk to you. <clears throat> Here are three things that higher education, including liberal education, might be for. One, getting a job. Two, becoming a certain kind of citizen. And three, the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake. Without speaking against any of these goals, there's something else we might recognize as an end of higher education, and especially liberal education. Call it personhood, personality, or character. This is Nietzsche's main concern in Use and Abuse of History for Life, the core text that the organizers of this conference assigned to its participants. I'm going to begin my talk by just assuming that we know what personality or personhood or character is, although each of these terms has a somewhat different nuance, and that it's something that we, like Nietzsche, care about, and that we can care about it even if we're not sure how we exactly feel about the kind of person that Nietzsche wants us to be. Now I'm just going to assume that we agree with Nietzsche about three more things that concern personhood. First, that personhood is a developmental phenomenon, unlike, say, human rights, which we would all have from birth, and which we can never lose. Personhood or personality or character, in contrast, is something that a human being may have more or less of, in Nietzsche's terms, it can be strong or weak. It's something that can be revealed and also developed under favorable conditions. Or the opposite, it can get buried or fail to develop under hostile ones. That's the first thing I'm just going to say we can agree with Nietzsche about, although there's all kinds of questions. Second, Nietzsche thinks, and I think we can agree, 
that this development of personhood is not only a matter of what happens in the first few years of your life or in childhood, but it's something relevant for the ages you students all are now. Not only do you not yet know all that you will come to know, you are not yet already all the person you will ever be. Third, and finally, Nietzsche thinks that your higher education is important for the development of your personality. But also, that higher education could take a pernicious, anti-developmental form. If this is true, then, in theory, a higher education could help you get a good job, help you become a citizen, foster your appreciation of knowledge for its own sake, and yet fail, and even corrupt you in a way that touches you more personally. As you know from use and abuse of history for life, Nietzsche believed that the higher education of his nation and time was viciously anti-developmental for persons. The reason why it was anti-developmental was its inveterate historicism. He thought that young persons became lost under the demand to always study the histories of others. He thought that their personalities were drained to the point of eternal non-subjectivity. That's a quote. Which the educators of his day esteemed as objectivity but which turned out, he just says, to be indistinguishable from, quote, a habit of not taking things too seriously anymore. Academia did not aim at what Nietzsche esteems, quote, finished, ripe, and harmonious personalities. Instead, it subordinated the student's personality to a method. Following the principle of the division of labor, it was, as he says, a scientific factory. In the factory, Young people lost their capacities for wonder and astonishment. They were busy, always hurrying to do something. But on the other hand, they couldn't care less. And so far as they really wanted anything, says Nietzsche, it was comfort. If a person in the scientific factory happened to have a character and a manner of his own, then it was seated so deeply that it couldn't struggle out to the light of it at all. That's just a summary of Nietzsche's position against the education of this day. Now, if you're like me, it's impossible to read Nietzsche's strenuous description of old German higher education without wondering whether or to what degree it also describes us. Now, the good news is that we're not 19th century German academics. We're not inveterate historicists in the way Nietzsche describes. On the contrary, actually, among us, and especially among my fellow Americans, Nothing is so overrated as the present. The bad news, I think, is that the harmful effects of inveterate historicism and blind presentism can be exactly the same. A person lost in historical consciousness and a person cut off from historical consciousness are both impoverished in their personhood. The philosopher I'm thinking of here is Alistair McIntyre who argued that human actions cannot be characterized without narrative history of a certain kind. Put a different way, without a sense of the story we are part of, we simply cannot know what we're doing. And this is a kind of suffering, argues McIntyre. For McIntyre, then, there's a virtue of having an adequate sense of the traditions to which one belongs or which confront one. There are other links between historicism and presentism, but I'm going to move quickly <laughs> to get where I want to go. So McIntyre aside, everything else aside, I think we can recognize that Nietzsche's characterization of academia has some bite against us. While no one who works here at this outstanding institution would describe it as a scientific factory, people do sometimes talk about our activity as the production of knowledge and might even talk about the kind of students we want to produce. Even the outstanding humanist Martha Nussbaum uses this language. These are factory words. And it's not just a matter of language. As this conference is going on, Barb Berlin's fourth-year students are publicly presenting their theses, written over the course of a year under the individual direction of a faculty member. Now, I know an accomplished academic, whose serious advice to a student writing her senior thesis in a liberal arts college was, find some small problem that no one has ever addressed and work on that. So in a Nietzschean spirit, let's ask, what happens to the person who applies herself seriously to writing a thesis like that? 
Now the answer that cuts against me is, I'll tell you what happens to that person. She gets into graduate school. <laughs> but let me repeat the question with some, ec with some extra emphasis. What happens to the person who applies herself right, seriously to writing a thesis like that? To find some small problem no one has ever worked on. Now the most harmless answer we can think of to this question is nothing. Nothing happens to that person. But nothing is what happens to the person who learns how to make hummus or to, make first, or to, do, or to perform first aid. <laughs> That person is unaffected by his new education in hummus making or first aid. He's the same person, only with new skills. And if the same thing were true of writing a senior thesis in a liberal arts college, wouldn't we find that disappointing? If so, you probably agree with Nietzsche that higher education could, should contribute to the development of a person. And if you're looking for a definition of liberal education, this might be one of the things that distinguish it from mainstream higher education in a research university. That's the first section of the talk. Now I want to go back to archaic Greece. That's roughly 700 <laughs> to 500 BC. It's after the composition of Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, but it's before most of the art, architecture, drama, and philosophy that people typically study or think about as just Greek. It's old. That's a big jump from here to there. So let me get there via Nietzsche. One of Nietzsche's favorite maxims was, become who you are. It was the epigram of his master's thesis, his very first academic work. A version of it is the subtitle of his very last book, Ecce Homo, How One Becomes What One Is. It also appears in the gay science, and in thus spoke Zarathustra. Now what Nietzsche is citing in all of these versions of the maxim, is an archaic Greek poet, Pindar, who composed elaborate song and dance performances for athletic victors in the Olympics and other important Panhellenic games. Become who you are is a phrase that appears in Pindar's second Pythian ode, composed for Hiram, tyrant of Syracuse, on the occasion of a victory in a chariot race at the Pythian games. Here we go. Not hard. Yeah, boy. Again, noi. Oyos. Esi. Okay. Become <laughs> such a sort of a male or female. You are. Okay. There's three words. Now with Nietzsche's blessing, let me be deliberately unhistorical <laughs> and try to isolate this phrase for a moment from its context in Pinder's very difficult O and in the corpus of Nietzsche. What is it? What does this mean? <laughs> I think the thing that should strike us about the phrase is that it's paradoxical. If you are someone, you don't need to become him or her. But if you could be sensibly urged to become a certain sort of a person, how are you actually that person? This is a kind of philosophic riddle. If there is being, how can there be becoming? If there is becoming, how can there be being? Now, the solution to the riddle is given by the very next word in Pindar, which I haven't put up there, and which Nietzsche typically omits. What this means is learning. Become who you are, learning. The paradox of become who you are is the meaning of learning. It is what education is. If who you are did not need becoming, if it was a given, say as your genetic code, full stop, or your pure romantic authenticity, you would not need education. But if, on the contrary, there were no who you are, 
If you were only becoming and no being, then your education would be indistinguishable from being brainwashed. And the finest liberal arts college in the world would be no different than a so-called education camp, as you would find in a tyranny. So, that is how you say developmental personhood in or through education in Greek. That's really an abridged <laughs> version of what would be really called for to, to understand this. Okay, all right, but hey, let's move. Let's move forward. Okay. Let's say we're back in archaic Greece now. I want to shift our gaze actually a little bit from the from the costly and elaborate Pindaric performances to something more pervasive and democratic to the venue or institution in which young adults who were not victorious athletes would be educated. So before there was anything resembling a college or university, even before the flourishing of the tragic theater, which comprised something like a general civic education, what there was was the symposium. A symposium literally means drinking together event. But the core activity of the archaic symposium was not, I think, the drinking of alcohol, it was the singing of songs. More specifically, it was the singing of short-ish songs, sung by individuals, individual persons, not groups, who typically use the first person, I, in the song. So, I'll give you an example. I'll give you a quick example. Um, here's the beginning of, of a song by a guy named Minervus. Tis to be us, tida ter dona ter cruz seis aphrodites, teth naeim hotamoi make it a tautamaloi, cru tadie filotes, kai me legadora, kai une. So, what this means is, what is life? What is joy without golden Aphrodite? May I die when such things no longer concern me. Hidden love persuasive gifts, and a bed. Okay. <laughs> I like this poem. So, <laughs> it has a surprising ending. <laughs> it's a very bad ending. All right. <laughs> it's a joke for anyone who... Nobody here. Okay. <laughs> but look, what's important about this? It's a, may I die, I... I hope I'm dead, right? When these things, when I don't, when I don't care about these things anymore, when I'm an old, crusty dude, all right, there's no camera here, and I don't even care about these things, just let me die. Okay. Right. That's a song. So what you're missing in my rendition is actually, so we receive these things as poems, texts on the page, but they're not texts on the page. They're songs. They're li the lyrics of songs we don't have the melodies to. Minerva, in particular, this is probably, I think, I'll say, certainly accompanied by, a, by a, an aulos, which is some kind of a, of a double oboe, uh, which was pay, played by a, you don't want to know this, but it was played by a, a woman. You may want to know this. A woman. And her name was Nano. And Minerva wrote a, let me use the correct term, terminology, he composed an album of songs about his love for Nano, his flute player. Isn't that interesting? Okay. <laughs> so Minerva makes use of a professional to accompany him, but a talented singer like Sappho right, would accompany herself. She uses a lyre. <clears throat> okay, the most important thing to stress about the archaic symposium is that the sympathetic audience participates in the performances. It's like Dresden theaters. That's not a key. Okay, forget that. The audience members are also the singers. Minerva or Sappho is just the most talented singer in your local community. Unlike other later communities, the archaic Greeks do not bring in outside professionals to do their entertaining for them. They place a high value on the spontaneous ability to recite or sing songs. The second most important thing to say, I already mentioned it maybe briefly, is that this is a pre-literate community. 
So no one's writing down or reading any of these songs. You learn songs by listening to others perform them. If a singer wants to be famous, he has to make songs that other people want to learn by heart. So he has to please or make some other kind of impact. If people learned your song, then it might travel around Greece and maybe even outlive you. All that we have is our stuff like, stuff like that. The symposium was more or less a small and more or less stable community. We could say that the character of the community is probably elitist in the sense that each of them probably has its own leading figure or figures who, who, who set the tone, maybe more than that. But it's also egalitarian and even ruthlessly so, because you can't be present without being required to sin in turn. You cannot spectate only. Someone might even decide to address a song to you personally. There are lots of fragments like this that name names. <clears throat> Someone may address a song to you personally, and then everybody's looking at you for a reply. I have some examples of that, but I'm going to skip over them. So you have to participate. What you sing is up to you. You could perform an original composition, worked out in practice beforehand. You might totally improvise. And you might perform the good old classics. And then all sorts of variations on these things are possible. Old classics with new twists that you write in the end, things you work out beforehand but pretend are spontaneous. There's all kinds of stuff you can do. <coughs> it might be important to stress that there's nothing wrong with performing the, the classics. We place a high value on originality in art. The archaic Greeks think somewhat differently about that. So one can be a strong personality in a symposium without being a unique personality. And I think this might be a little bit challenging for us to wrap our heads around. And maybe I should also say that one can be a strong personality without being a problematic personality. So a therapist friend of mine says that among her fellow therapists, if one says of a new patient, he's quite a personality, what that really means is, uh-oh, <laughs> this is a disaster. And personality disorders are known to be the most difficult to treat. By analogy to what's, what I'm trying to describe, and, and the devaluation of originality in, in comparison with what we think, <coughs> I think you can think actually of DJs and clubs. Some of them make their own music, and sometimes they make it live, right? although a lot of that is, of course, prepared beforehand. But other DJs, even quite famous ones, are kinds of curators, aren't they? They too come prepared to, to, to the party, but they have an ability to feel the mood of the room, know just what to play when, when you need to stay with something, and when you need to change it up. And this is a talent. And then there are, of course, lots of performers who are remixing old classics. Right? So if you think of a Berlin club as a symposium, you're actually not far off. In order to get further inside the symposium and how it might be in education, let me work out an example of an imaginative exercise. So, say I'm in a symposium, and people are singing songs, and a theme has developed or emerged. People have gotten around to singing songs about memory and the value of the past. And what the past counts for in comparison with life now. Then someone talented stands up and sings a song celebrating a new love affair. And in celebrating this new experience, dismisses all of her previous love experiences. So she sings, bear with me now. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I knew, I'm near you, <laughs> I get that urge to feel you. Just touching you and loving you makes everything right. I never knew love before. Then came you. Then came you. Okay, this is Dion Warwick and the Spinners. That's 1974. Okay, you get the point. Have I undermined my entire... People <laughs> are now like... Um, Education should be nothing like <laughs> But look, imagine if that were a good performance. <laughs> imagine if everyone would applaud. But say, so, so, so say someone performed. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> good night, everyone. <laughs> okay, so say that were a good performance, and that, and I, I, I recognize the talent in that song, okay? But say, I'm, as I listen to that, you know, it strikes me as something wrong. There's something wrong in that song. It strikes me as a kind of cop-out from a genuinely difficult problem. Problem is, what do you say, what do you do, what do you do as in inside yourself? What do you do with your old love affairs, your memories of old loves, when you fall in love with a new person? What do you say to that new person about your old loves, and what do you say to yourself? And the song I just painfully sang solves that problem by just saying, all that old stuff was not love. Okay? And so I was listening to that and I felt like, that, that, come on. It's not. That's a cop-out. Maybe I even used to be the person who's singing. Maybe I even used to be that person's lover. And when that person sings, I never knew love before, now it really bothers me. I could think to myself, yeah, okay, it ended, it didn't work out, but how can you say you never loved me? If all these things were true, then when this person is done in the symposium, and the applause has died down, I might stand up and sing a different song. Maybe I'll sing the Beatles in my life, as the best expression I know of what I feel and what I think has to be better and more honest. In this song, the singer celebrates his new love, while at the same time trying to acknowledge and do justice to the love he felt for his past lovers. He refuses to say, I never knew love before. And then when I begin to sing John Lennon's words, there are places I remember, I really am, in a non-literal but meaningful sense, the I in the words, even if I didn't write that song. When I take it on in a context like that, I am that person. That's what it feels like. And maybe I always liked that song, because I have it memorized, but I never really knew what it was about. But now I sing it, and it has a new meaning. Now I know what I think and feel. That's the development of personality, or personhood, in action. We can even go further. Now suppose I have a good friend in the symposium, let's call him Thomas, who thinks that the Beatles' handling of the dilemma is also a cop-out that something about the necessarily tragic character of love and history is being glossed over or pushed away by John Lennon. Then this Thomas might stand up and sing another song to express what he feels. Maybe he finds the Beach Boys, God Only Knows. You start to see why the classics are the classics. But even if there weren't a classic to express what he thinks and feels, Thomas might feel pressure to compose a new one on the spot or to work it out and present it next time. And when he performs, he might make me re-examine what I think and feel. And now you have another idea of the kind of education that's going on in the archaic symposium. Okay. <clears throat> I can say a lot more. I can say a lot more about the, the archaic symposium to satisfy your curiosity and, and things, but maybe I just Again, like make a huge jump, look at the pages I'm about to turn. It's tough. Okay. But you get the idea. I wonder if I can really skip all that. All right. Here we go. What on earth? <laughs> That's a funny moment to take a drink. What on earth can we as participants in the 21st century liberal arts programs learn or take from education in the archaic Greek symposium. Now, obviously we can't drink wine and sing songs all day, can we? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a list of the ways I think the liberal arts should reflect the archaic symposium. There are 13 items on my list. I can talk about those 13 items at more or less length. I'm going to try and be crisp and we'll see what interests you. Okay. The first thing I, can, I think we should take from the Archaeus Symposium is surprisingly literal. Literal. It's the songs. I think music and musical texts are, should be an important part of a liberal arts curriculum. 
The difficulty is how to think and talk about them in non-technical ways. I even think something analogous should be part of the liberal arts experience. Let me give an example of this from my own classroom. When I have taught Homer's Odyssey here, I give an assignment to make a picture or some other kind of artistic representation of any scene in the epic poem and present it to the class. What happens is that students represent scenes which they consider the most painful, the most hopeful, the most beautiful, etc., etc., scenes in the poem. The artwork becomes the vehicle for a serious and fundamental emotional connection with the text. And I think what this is, is an appropriation and reperformance of a classical song. And I find that when students study in this way, nobody asks questions about the use or the relevance of the material for their lives. That was number one. Number two, as in the symposium, our egalitarianism should be ruthless. If you are present, you must contribute. Number three, you must be physically present. <laughs> this is harder than it sounds, actually. So I'll just very quickly say, I now have a friend at a university in England, and in every classroom he teaches in, there are recording devices that automatically record everything that goes on. Why? So that students who don't want to get up in the morning, or can't for some reason, can log in later and listen to the class. I don't like this. I think a person takes a risk by participating in a genuine conversation. And to do it well, little short of trust is required. The invisible listeners in on other people's conversations are parasitic on the students who show up and take risks. And invisible eavesdroppers make it difficult to build up trust. Okay, that was number three. Number four. The liberal arts community should be relatively stable and small. This is because the most favorable condition for building person personhood is the meaningful interaction with others who one knows as persons. This points to the residential college as the place where the liberal arts belongs. Five. The professors should be available as persons, not merely professionals. To say that they are available as persons does not necessarily mean they are personable. <laughs> as in friendly. But if you ask them what they really think, they will try to tell you. Six, the liberal arts community has the same two ways of failing that the archaic symposium had. Boredom and internal fighting. Okay, I didn't make that case with the symposium, but maybe you can imagine. Sometimes people pick fights as a way to stave off their boredom. A leading figure or figures in a liberal arts community needs to pay attention to this and to work to ward off both those things. Leading figures in those communities might be administrators, professors, or students. Seven, the mimetic appropriation of confirmed classics is an important part of the activity of the liberal arts. Let me again use an example from my own classroom to say what this is like, the mimetic appropriation of a classic. When I teach Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, when I've taught once, I gave an assignment to produce an account of something the student considers to be an ethical virtue, and to do it in the Aristotelian style and present it to the class. I think this is not a dead rhetorical exercise, although it resembles the kind of exercises that Ulrico was talking about yesterday, that the ones that the German Romantics rebelled against. Right? In my class, I think, not only did certain individuals shine forth in what they talked about as a virtue, but what came to light was a previously unknown, loose consensus about the existence of a certain virtue Aristotle does not talk about. We discussed this. And this became an opportunity either for solidarity with the group or for individuation and distinction from the group as a student. 
Those are both personality building. Let me call the next one 7B. <laughs> 7B, 7A was about creative appropriation. Now I want to say in 7B that even memorization should make a comeback. And again, I don't think this has to be a dead exercise. I think a poem learned by heart, as George Steiner beautifully says, modifies the spaces and constructs of one's inner being and becomes an agency in our consciousness, a pacemaker in the growth and vital complication of our identity. That's a lot, but whatever. I get the drift. Eight. There is a value in spontaneity. So the, the previous two things, memorization, that's not spontaneous. Now I want to go the other way. There's a value in spontaneity. When we actually discuss something, we do not know what is going to happen. There are limits to how much a class or a course or a module should be planned. Why cannot syllabi contain spaces to fill in later? As the student's interest turns this way or that, we must resist detailed lists of learning outcomes and the inevitable technologies of assessment that follow close behind. If the students as persons actually mattered, then every class should be different. The live classroom, the unique conversational event, should be at the center of the liberal arts. Everything else is secondary. Nine. Like the subjects of sympotic songs, our subjects, as our subjects of investigation will run the gamut from low to high. However, in the case of the low, we will also aim at wisdom. And in the case of the high, we will value pleasure. We take what pleases us as a reason to care. We do not try to undermine our pleasure. We try to understand it, looking forward to more. Ten. Like the sympotic singers, we attend to what we actually value not just to what we disvalue. Academia is littered with classes on fake transgressive subjects like hatred or evil. Nothing now is more genuinely transgressive in the sense of really countercultural and difficult to pull off than attending to the opposites of those things. I mean love or goodness. Eleven. I said, or may not have said, I didn't say, I'll say. <laughs> Sympathic play. So not only are you singing songs, I didn't say this, there are, there's wine, there's music, there's even other elements, there's some evidence of costuming involved. What is all that about? It's about the creation of a special kind of atmosphere. Something like kind of a magical atmosphere, a place that's different from the everyday world. When you play in that atmosphere, you have an opportunity, I think, to experience feelings, thoughts, and even whole states of being quite different from your usual mundane self. A liberal arts student should likewise try on how certain thoughts feel, experiencing for a short time what it feels like to be the kind of person who thinks whatever. This is thrilling, free, and anxiety-inducing. Twelve. Because it's anxiety-inducing to feel different than you ordinarily are, because it's anxiety-inducing, like the Archaic Symposium, the liberal arts college should be what Nietzsche should have what Nietzsche calls an enveloping atmosphere, a mood that is something both protective and magical, so personalities are able to grow. Now I'm going to say something very contestable. This means that the college should recover a standing as a legitimate retreat from the world. The point of a retreat is not to flee from anxiety, as with a safe space. The point of a retreat is to ward off some anxieties so you can feel others more intensely. This view of the college, here's something contestable, will require progressives to bite a certain bullet because you can't have a retreat if you're constantly um, valorizing engagement. Finally, 13. There should be a diversity of liberal arts colleges with their own local characters. We do not need a supposedly rational, universal, homogenous form to be pressed down upon all institutions from above. And the liberal arts, taken in general, does not need to be all things to all people. In conclusion, I'm taking too long, Michael. 
In conclusion, in order to address a great range of aspects within a student's person, a liberal, as opposed to disciplinary education, should ask the student to consider a diversity of kinds of objects of study. An ancient epic poem and a modern philosophical article, a French revolution and a paramecium. This may suggest interdisciplinarity. But the more important difference between a liberal and a disciplinary higher education ought to lie in the way the objects are studied. In a liberal education, the student is asked to draw from the total self she already has and the consideration of the material before her. This does not mean that the liberal arts class is an empty exercise in the sharing and validating of personal opinions. I think, rather, it is a very difficult exercise in that it requires the student to become involved in what she's learning and to make an effort to represent her considered views with the understanding that these views may well be, one, transitional to other ones, or two, they could be hard. That too could be frightening. In such an education, the easy recourse to and relief of banality, such as, just tell me what I need to know for the test, that kind of banality ought never to become available, never to be available. Neither should the student be permitted to form his or her view of an object of study through a survey of disciplinary literature on that object. In fact, since a Google search can now yield what used to take hours in a good library, the teacher must find a way to actively discourage this. And in this way, I think, a liberal approach to higher education must remain significantly pre- or non-disciplinary. Thank you for your attention. So, um, that's my title. Uh, slightly revised in the program. Uh, I am, in the interest of time, going to really just uh, set a certain number of objects in front of us in ways that I hope um, uh, bring out some of the central themes of what David has said, because honestly, um, I feel uh, very much that uh, many of the things that I most want to say through Arendt's um, a crisis of Education, a text written in the middle of the 20th century and primarily focused on primary <laughs> education and to a certain extent um, secondary education but not tertiary education. So the, the thoughts that I have to share are essentially, um, and, and there is a text that I'm working on that I'm happy to share with anyone here who's interested in it qua um, you know, scholarly essay, Philosophy of Education, the basic thought that I have is to extend Arendt's critique of progressive education, which has been a sort of subtext, I think, to David's um, talk in, in, in many ways, um, extend her critique of progressive education at the primary and to some extent secondary level to tertiary education, so higher education, um, and to the whole project of modern liberal arts education, which is, I think it's important to say, and this would be the last thing that I say really, I think, from, um, what I try to argue in the scholarly work, uh, our modern project of liberal arts education, uh, which is to say a project that began in the United States in uh, the second and third decades of the 20th century, is very much the attempt to bring the principles of the then developing progressive education, uh, a form of education, primary education, early childhood education that many of us, I think, uh, at this college, that seems to be my experience and maybe our guests as well, know something about from the Waldorf movement, from the democratic school movement and other, um, and other kinds of uh, movements. So Arendt is concerned to argue against that. And I'm concerned in the piece that I'm working on that reflects on her reflection on that with extending that critique of progressive education to tertiary education. But I'll say little to nothing about that. There's one slide in what follows. I have only eight, and this is one of them. So um, I'll be brief, in other words. Um, and I won't say too much about what my scholarly point is. What I will try to say something about, so here's my thoughts for today. So essentially, this scholarly work that I'm describing is mostly 2.3 on this outline, right? So it's a, let's say, a 45-minute version of this sentence. The crisis in education is a crisis of traditional authority. And that's an argument that Arendt makes in this text. 
the crisis in education. And she's concerned with making it about primary education, that it's the education of the quite young, right? the education of people from, so early childhood education and, and primary, the first schooling, so meaning from birth until, you know, it depends, right? Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, but something like that. Um, and so that's that whole body of uh, thinking. And I'll say a little bit, a tiny bit, um, about that more when we get there. But I guess what I mostly want to talk about in the 17 minutes or so that I'll allot to myself before we open up the conversation, because I'm at least quite eager to hear what you all have to say about the provocative things that David has said and the mildly provocative things that I might add, is to try to tease out a little bit more of the intellectual background um, of a lot of what um, David said, which I thought was so so beautiful, and specifically to, to, to bring out what was so Nietzschean about it, at least to me listening. So I don't think, in the interest of time, that I'm going to read these out, but there are five passages from the use and abuse of history. I don't know if they were on David's mind when, when uh, he was um, you know, laying out this argument, but they certainly resonated with me. So I think I'll point to them, and I'm going to point to them as we go through this. And so hopefully you see some of this, and especially one one, so I'm going to just refer to these now this way. So this is the, right, so 1.1, which is Nietzsche and spiritual education, or education of the whole person, or education of the personality, um, versus scientism, the knowledge factory, this kind of motif. So I just have a couple of passages from the use and abuse of history for life that refer to that, that I get to via Arendt. So for those who are concerned about the Arendt angle, I'm always happy to talk about Arendt. Mm -hmm. So we could talk, all of these are also important to her. Um, so she, because her reflection itself is Nietzschean. Uh, and the second thought that I have for us under this sort of Nietzschean moment is the unity of the will to knowledge. And so the falsity of what had been taken to be um, a fundamental orienting truth of the modern university, the division of knowledge and the pursuit of knowledge into the exact sciences and the sciences of spirit, into in English what's more normal to call science or natural science and humanities. And then that huge question of the social sciences, right? Are the social sciences over here with the humanities? fake soft science or not science at all, or are the social sciences exact sciences just with a different domain than another exact science such as particle physics or molecular biology or paleontology. Um, so that's uh, all under the heading of the thought that our post-postmodern moment, that's an argument of course, but let's say that that's what we're living through right now, is what Arendt following Nietzsche called the modern break in tradition and with the concept of history. Um, so the next thing that I want to do uh, is to lay out um, some central aspects of Arendt's thinking about authority and tradition with reference to a, a couple of other essays that are collected with the crisis in education in a text called Between Past and Future, which gives the title to my presentation today. And then to close with some provisional conclusions, which will include um, the last passage from Nietzsche's Use and Abuse of History for Life that I'll put in front of us briefly. So this is, what I'm now gonna do is really just put the objects in front of us, which is to say the quotes, and there'll be next to no commentary for me. Uh, so we'll see how this goes, but this is what, um, so, here we go. Arendt writes in Tradition in the Modern Age that Nietzsche was well aware of the profound nonsense of the new value-free science, which was soon to degenerate into scientism and into general scientific superstition. And when uh, she says that, um, I think that she's referring to that which David referred to early in his talk and speaking about the education of his day and the reign of historicism, which may not resonate that strongly with all of us who don't spend more time than we wish to thinking about um, the intellectual climate of 19th century Germany, but just some things that if you'd read The Use and Abuse of History for Life might have um, 
uh, that might help you to call to mind the thing that's being critiquing as being critiqued here as the profound nonsense of the new um, value-free science would be the conclusion of section one of the essay, uh, the last three paragraphs, and I would call attention especially uh, to the first sentence of the second to last paragraph of section one, I'm not going to read out this whole three-paragraph passage, but just this one sentence where uh, Nietzsche writes, history conceived as pure science and become sovereign would constitute a kind of final closing out of accounts of life for mankind. Um, so, we could talk more about that, but that, to me, this is what, what came to mind in hearing this sort of early moment in um, David's talk, and which um, I would want us to think about as the background for this reference in um, Arendt, which gets uh, the following argument going. Namely, this is now from the concept of history, so I'm using different um, different statements from different essays that are collected in this volume between past and future, and they, they're written for different purposes um, and at somewhat different times, but we could talk about this method of reading these particular um, chapters together this way. So this quote that follows is from Arendt's Concept of History, Like Her Tradition in the Modern Age, a reflection on Nietzsche's untimely meditations and chiefly the use and abuse of history for life. She writes, the 19th century opposition of the natural and historical sciences, together with the allegedly absolute objectivity of precision of the natural sciences, so think of how many times objectivity came up in, in, in David's uh, talk, is today a thing of the past. So this is a self-historical claim, right? So it's, there's a kind of irony here to, to reading the concept of history. Physics is no less a man-centered inquiry into what is than historical research. The old quarrel, therefore, between the subjectivity of historiography and the objectivity of physics has lost much of its relevance. Um, and I guess that uh, here uh, I wanted to connect this issue of objectivity and uh, subjectivity to um, the sort of uh, close of the first part of David's talk, if, if you recall it, before we went into um, archaic, um, uh, into the archaic symposium and started to wonder about what we could um, mine from that um, cultural environment for our own understanding of the cultivation of the person as an educational project today, uh, with a passage that ends uh, section five and begins section six of uh, the advantages and disadvantages or abuse and abuse of history for life. This is on page 32 in the edition um, that you would have. And here again, I want, I'm thinking about uh, from, this is probably the penultimate sentence, but from the phrase, the historical education of our critics um, until the end of the first paragraph of, uh, of the sixth par or the end of the first paragraph of the sixth section, in this case, more unjust, but maybe um, the key phrase would be the weakness of the modern personality at the very end. These are basically the last words of section five. So maybe this is what we should have in mind in this space, this, the, the weakness, um, uh, the impotence, as he calls it, the impotentia of, uh, of modern subjectivity is precisely in sacrificing its own subjectivity right on this crucible, this false dichotomy between subjectivity and objectivity. Um, so here now, two more quotes from Arendt's concept of history. Um, and the fuller, so these would be, so, and this would uh, also be my third and fourth references. There's like three things, there's like a seven-wheel circus going on here. Maybe I should drop it, but just to put them out there, um, the, the Nietzschean motifs I have in mind here would be um, on pages 41 and 42 in our, this is 
um, paragraph seven, really critical paragraphs that were section seven, uh, the very bottom <laughs> of page 41, the flooding, numbing, violent, historicizing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like, what really is the crime of historical consciousness? Uh, that's where you have to you have to look to section seven. Like, if you really want to feel, if you want the, I know, like David was trying to do the thing of like appreciating things, and I thought you appreciated the symposium so well, and now I'm doing another thing and I feel guilty. But you know, it's uh, so. This is where, if we want. But, you know, right, yes, yeah. so that would be the idea, the violent historicizing which, um, you know, eviscerates everything that's good and holy about song, <laughs> something like that. Um, and the other passage in our core text, this is on 60, um, would be, so the, what does historicizing do? Uh, look at, this is paragraph 10, uh, so we're re really at the end, or section 10, uh, the first full paragraph on page, like, uh, you know, American paragraph, section 10, the first, the only full paragraph on page 60, above all, by destroying a superstition, the belief in the necessity of that educational procedure, right, what, what you know, what are we doing, what, what's his counter-historicist, historicizing move, his counter-historicist, histor no. his counter-historicist, historicizing move is to call into question in true historicist fashion the historicist belief in his own objectivity. And it is his, by the way. Right, so the historicist belief in his own objectivity. And that project is what Arendt is continuing here. Um, in um, the concept of history. Uh, here's how she puts it. This is no longer a question of academic objectivity. It cannot be solved by the reflection that man is a question asking being, naturally can receive only answers to match his own questions. This is a paraphrase of Werner Heisenberg, by the way. She's thinking about Werner Heisenberg's lectures later, a book, not yet a book when she writes this, uh, Physics and Philosophy. So that's what she, she's um, referring to here. What is really undermining the whole modern notion that meaning is contained in the process as a whole, and that should really, for those who read The Use and Abuse of History with some care, that phrase should really resonate right, with, with Nietzsche's um, own way of putting it, is that everything, is that everything is possible, not only in the realm of ideas, but in the field of reality itself. Right? Everything is possible, and that's what historicism does, is it eviscerates that permanent possibility, that impotentia back at the end of, whatever that was, paragraph five, right? the weakness of the modern spirit, because it's a despiritualizing spirit that's trying to suck the possibility out of everything. Right? And what does that do, says Arendt, and this would be, perhaps a bit of, in my estimation, an advance, or an extension at least, right, of Nietzsche's analysis. This you won't find in um, Use and Abuse of History for Life, although obviously it's responding to Heidegger's own appropriation, misappropriation, misreading, if Tracy's still here, right? We should not appreciate Heidegger's reading of Nietzsche. I'm not gonna fight that fight, there you are. Um, so maybe this owes something to Heidegger, but I don't, I think we could, you know, we write that out. But anyway, in the situation of radical world alienation, neither history nor nature is at all conceivable. This twofold loss of the world has left behind it a society of men who, without a common world, which would at once relate and separate them, either live in desperate lonely separation or press together in a mass. Enter liberal education. Okay, now, here we go. Uh, so in four minutes, we're going to save ourselves from this morass of world alienation. Uh, for if I am right, if I am right, in suspecting, now we flip back to tradition of the modern age, by the way. So we've left the concept of history, which is kind of an intellectual history thing, and we're back in tradition of the modern age, which is really a political commentary. So they're related, but slightly different emphasis, right? 
For if I am right in suspecting that the crisis of the present world, <laughs> this world alienation that she's just described, is primarily political, okay, it's primarily political, and that the famous, quote, decline of the West, okay, this is not like Samuel Huntington or whatever these books were written 17 years ago, right, but the famous decline of the West, she writes already, um, in tradition in the modern age in um, the end of the 1950s, consists primarily in the decline of the Roman trinity of religion, tradition, and authority, then the revolutions of the modern age appear like gigantic attempts to repair these foundations, to renew the broken thread of tradition, and to restore, through founding new political bodies, what for so many centuries had endowed the affairs of men with some measure of dignity and greatness. So this is surely like monumental history, right? Um, something like that. The project of monumental history, of taking that impetus, right? Not the antiquarian, bookish, I'm going to know everything and, you know, know the, know the ancient, know the dead languages the best. But the monumental spirit, like to, you know, to give some measure of dignity and greatness to what we do. Revolutions, she continues, which we commonly regard, this is the same paragraph, basically, um, the end of it. Revolutions, which we commonly regard as radical breaks with tradition, appear in our context, American, French, Russian, um, primarily, appear in our context as events in which the actions of men are still inspired by and derive their strength from the origins of this transition. And here we come to the crisis in education. And so educational institutions have to be read as part of this political project of world building. Attempts to engage meaningfully with the tradition and to give some measure of dignity and greatness um, to our lives. Whenever in political questions sound human reason fails, or gives up the attempt to supply answers, we are faced by a crisis. For this kind of reason is really that common sense by virtue of which we and our five individual senses are fitted into a single world, common to us all, and by the aid of which we move around in it. In every crisis, a piece of the world, something common to us, is destroyed. A crisis in education, this is Two, these are two related thoughts that come somewhat later in the essay. This first one was from the very beginning. These next ones come from kind of the middle and toward the end. A crisis in education would at any time give rise to serious concern, even if it did not reflect a more general crisis and instability in modern society. But it does. Right? The problem of education in the modern world lies in the fact that by its very nature, it cannot forgo either authority or tradition, yet must proceed in a world that is neither structured by authority nor held together by tradition. So here I'm thinking about the third section, or maybe the fourth, but you skip the third. But you know, this sort of this closing moment where we then left the archaic symposium and came back to our own moment and thought about, okay, well, that was like a nice little, you know, right? that was a nice afternoon diversion. In, in the uh, archaic uh, symposium, what could that possibly have to do with us, right? And some of the things, you know, on that list of 13, right, like learn how to memorize a poem, or appropriate in a new way, or, right, do a dance, or make a picture in some way, you know, create a representational work of art from your, from a scene in the Odyssey that really moved you, right? This is exactly this kind of gesture, I think, right, what Arendt is pointing to that there's no way for education, even in our modern world, to forgo authority or tradition. It cannot, because education, as Nietzsche's pointing out, is impossible. The development of the personality, spiritual advancement, is impossible without finding yourself in a tradition in some sense, or again, all the way back to the beginning of David's talk, the reference to Alistair MacIntyre, for those who know you know, that, that way of telling the story. But, of course, in our space-time here, in our democratic, progressive life world, we're anti-authoritarians and anti-traditionalists, almost by 
by fiat, actually, by almost by a kind of fiat. And we're not sure whose command it is exactly, but we all feel that command. And we feel ashamed and embarrassed if we're ever yielding to an authority of any kind. Um, and this leads me to, um, two minutes later than I wish to be, my uh, two provisional conclusions, which I think really rhyme with some comment. At some point, I was trying to combine these with uh, some of David's 13, and there's certainly a lot of resonance, but I abandoned the project of trying to say which ones, what, and we can talk about this. But here are my two claims. These are both highly contestable, and I'm sure they'd be controversial among my colleagues here in a way that I'm, so I, I, I'm ready to stand corrected. But here are the two things that I want to say. Following on rent. So I take these to be Arendtian claims. Again, she was writing about primary education, so it's not exactly right, but these are the extensions of Arendtian's and Nietzschean point about what a higher education is or could be um, today, a, a, a true education of the person in what I think is David's sense. Here's the first one. A core curriculum, whatever exactly that means, is necessary and sufficient for developing a common sense. That was that quote on 178. That common sense by virtue of which we and our five individual senses are fitted into a single world. Like there's a the cultivation of the person demands the cultivation of some kind of common sense. Sorry, almost there. Common sense discloses to us the nature of the world insofar as it is a common world. We owe it to the fact that our strictly private and subjective five senses and their sensory data can adjust themselves to a non-subjective and objective world which we have in common and share with others. Judging, so this, that, that cultivation of the person that this kind of education is meant to be, I want to argue with Arendt, is about the cultivation of the faculty of judgment. Judging, act, the active use of the faculty of judgment, is one important activity in which this sharing the world with others comes to pass. That moment, so maybe 7a and 7b is a good one, which David spent some time on, right? That, that moment of, in combination with 8, you know, sort of that moment where you take risks and you share with one another in the mode of appreciation something from the text, even if the text is very alien to you, and then you have that moment of, solidarity or individuation from the group, right? That's that judging. So you've made a judgment about the work, you share it with the others, and they make a judgment about your judgment. That's the kind of thing I think we're thinking about in this Nietzsche and Arendtian mode. And that, yeah, so, and that's the idea. So that's the, why it's so common. You need a core curriculum. You know, you need, it needs to be the case of the people at the table. Not only have they read the same thing today or listened to the same piece of music or looking at the same work of art, you know, projected on a screen, but you, it also needs to be the case that you can be confident that eight months ago, and 21 months ago, and 32 months ago, those persons also read and watched and listened to some of the same things with one another and with others. You must. It's a, it's a necessary condition, but I would warrant following it that it's also sufficient because we owe it to the fact, we owe it to the fact that our strictly private and subjective five senses can adjust themselves to a non-subjective and objective world. Where does that come from? Right? Not from some sort of power structure over determining the way that we find ourselves in the world, but from this act, I, I really like David's image, of solidarity and individuation. And it's always sort of engaging with and distancing from the others. But those concrete others that you do it with need to be the same, you need to know them, you need to know their names. I look out here, I don't know you all. <laughs> um, and, and so I'm not really doing this with you. <laughs> I need to really know who you are and you need to know who I am. I need to be available to you as a person, as David put it, somewhere on his list. And here's the second one, expressly interdisciplinary education is necessary and sufficient for freedom. As humanists, Arendt says, we can rise above these conflicts between the states. And this is the retreat, again, by the way. So these two talks really rhyme, for better and for worse. As humanists, which, which Arendt here identifies herself as, right? not a social scientist, not a political theorist, she's a humanist. As humanists, 
we can rise above, humanists may reject her, <laughs> she may not have been a very good humanist, <laughs> but anyway, as humanists, we can rise above these conflicts between the statesman and the artist, as we can rise in freedom above the specialties which all must learn and pursue. Then we shall know how to reply to those who so frequently tell us that Plato or some other great author of the past has been superseded. This is from The Crisis in Culture, another article on that. Um, and I have a, that, that, I'm reading that together with the penultimate paragraph of Nietzsche um, about how the Greeks learned gradually right smack in the middle of that middle paragraph. The Greeks learned gradually to organize chaos by reflecting on themselves in accordance with the Delphic teaching. That is, by reflecting on their genuine needs and by letting their sham needs die out. This is exactly what this sentence is saying. Right? So we rise in freedom above the specialties. Those specialties, molecular biology, I mean, I don't think Arendt agrees with Nietzsche here, by the way, but they're sham needs. I mean, they're needs for something, but they're certainly not needs for the cultivation of the person. And if education privileges those specialties and the sham needs that they can fulfill over our true needs, then woe you know, exactly. But, I'm going to end on a positive note, we humanists can rise above that. Uh, and that's what a liberal arts education is. Thanks, I'm done. I, thank you so much. It was so exciting. I can barely sit on my seat. Um, so, part one of the question is, if I'm writing for Guardian about this lecture, can I make the headline and say, the dead white male might have relevance for democratic societies? <laughs> Part two, I'm thinking because I'm so engaged with this debate on a personal level. And so part two is that part of the reason why there is uh, a need to remove the, the classical or the traditional as part of the, the, the latest debate, political debate is to find voices for identities that don't that don't can't relate to the texts but i'm thinking are these texts for everyone is this can they appeal to everyone um, and then because is there a, is there a universal element to them which is which is not a political okay that's it <laughs> um, I mean, you know, you're, you're, you're free to do whatever you want, um, for, for now at least. Um, no, we live in free societies. I, I guess, um, yeah, um, It was definitely on my part, at least, and David can speak for himself for sure. Uh, it was a conscious choice to quote Aaron saying this about Plato in particular. Uh, so, so for sure, Plato, as I often say in seminar, is probably the deadest of the dead white males. Um, but of course, I, deadest is true. I mean, if by dead we mean like already been made into a monument, which is to say also, ironically, the most alive. So I own that. Like, I find him to be, in Nietzsche's sense, very, very dead because he's so alive, um, because I have a monumental, I, I own that I have a, a monumental and non-antiquarian interest in Plato. So maybe it's something like that. You know, dead white males, insofar as they're objects of monumental and not antiquarian interest, have much to contribute to our uh, pluralist, open-ended, uh, non-objective, oriented uh, development of ourselves today in democratic society. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I need to say just a couple things. So. 
can't really do full justice to this, but actually, you know, democracy is born in the archaic symposium, actually. Um, and the, the primary texts of democracy are the songs of Solon. Um, so there should be, there should be a, 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 like an intense relevance. Um, I guess I also want to say you know, that the, the archaic and the classical Greeks perfectly recognize the greatness of Fina, Sappho. I had no problem with that. Uh, so, and I, I do too. And I don't feel like I have a problem with that. Um, and in the, symp in the symposium, we, we know that one of the things men singing would do was sing songs with an eye that was a woman. Which is an interesting phenomenon, you know? Um, so, so, so what am I saying? I mean, I guess, yeah, I don't know. Let's just, let's just put those things out there. Personally, the most exciting things I taught this last year were both ancient Japanese texts. I, I want to know those things. I've given a paper on Chinese poetry, even though I don't read Chinese. Um, I don't know whether that's a weird kind of arrogance that I feel like I can do such a thing, or if it's a, if it's a, if, or how to think about that. Um, I, I want to, but and, I, and for some reason, maybe I'm mistaken. I don't, I don't know. I don't think of it as that problematic. Maybe that's, but maybe that's some something I'm making a mistake about. I, I don't know. I mean, I preface it because I work on Goethe, and I, I'm at the other end of the room. I have to justify why I work on Goethe as a dead white man. Uh -huh. So I think I, I wanted to, I want to be a, dead, a devil's advocate and be like, why? Uh -huh. and I, I hear what you're saying. <laughs> <clears throat> I wanted to push you on dimensions of the last two points that you made. Mm -hmm. um, on the first part about the core curriculum, mm -hmm. and I am very sympathetic to the idea that if various different people come together and have some kind of common reference point, mm -hmm. that builds a sense of commonality. Um, and so I wonder if a university advocates that kind of idea, um, the, number one, <coughs> Would it be hypocritical if they did not also push for a diversity of their student population? Mm -hmm. Because if you come, if you just gather a pool of students from a say, uniform background and you have this core curriculum, mm -hmm. then you're not really living, um, invigorating the idea of contemplating on a plural, complex society. Mm -hmm. I was wondering what you thought about these practical or more political consequences. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that's absolutely right. Um, and so, um, say core curriculum, I think that the, so, and, and here David and I probably have some differences, or historically have some differences, or I could imagine that we do, so I'd be interested to hear what you think too. But I guess for myself, what I would say, not speaking about this institution's core curriculum, but just myself, that I think the fact of the core curriculum is by some order, maybe even orders of magnitude, more important than the, the Constitution, the, in other words, what you have inside of it. Uh, so I think that you have one, and is the most important thing. And then, if I'm thinking about other important things, the future that you're describing, so a genuine, a, a genuine plurality of backgrounds uh, by any possible metric. So that would include what we would call socioeconomic backgrounds, meaning class is super important, and that's a challenge for liberal education, insofar as it is almost universally private or privately funded, even when it's public. Not absolutely universally. I taught for one year at a public liberal arts institution in the United States. Not absolutely doesn't happen, but it, they exist. There's a council of them even, C-O-P-L-A-C, People in this room might be interested, the Council of Public Liberal Arts Colleges. Um, two of them closed. There are fewer of them than when I was a student. That's a sign of a kind that I didn't end up talking about today. But um, so socioeconomic, so I think class is very important. And then um, 
you know, ethnic geographic diversity. But then also, plurality, so I try to use the term plurality more with this in mind, you know, a genuine plurality of perspectives on the world, meaning, of course, also, you know, ideological and um, temperamental and other forms of plurality. So all that matters more. And then, yes, one has to think very carefully, I think, about what it is that one engages with. So, for example, that there would be music in it. Um, in a meaningful way, then it matters that there is music and what the music is. But I think that conversation is the conversation that comes third, at least among those three things, um, when it comes to this particular question that I think is our major theme between the two talks, which is um, liberal education or liberal arts education today as a way of constituting personality or as a way of defeating the um, the despiritualization of the modern world um, by um, scientism, which I think is still what we're largely suffering about. Maybe we, maybe we do have a different, uh, I mean, you said that the fact that one has one is more important than what it is you're actually doing. And so I, I don't, maybe I don't know, my, intu my, my, my intuition is to say no, no. I feel like all of, you know, like around the world, places that do have core curriculum, a lot of times the faculty who teach those things don't really want to be there, students don't really want to be there, they're kind of introductory classes that are not very exciting. You can't, I think, compose them, I, I think. You can. I actually think that there's an institution in Great Britain that just tried to institute one, and the students basically rebelled. Um, so, and I think at this school, which has probably the greatest core curriculum in the world. Um, the great thing about the core curriculum is it's not an introduction to anything. It's very serious from day one. And I think you need to read the kinds of things that, that can bear your most serious attention and, and, yeah, and to do them not as a prelude to something that's real coming later. Um, but they're a huge, it's a huge topic. But yeah. But not distribution requirements or general studies or something. <coughs> I guess I don't know if that's a core curriculum. Not necessarily. Yeah. But so I would like to use one of the points just made uh, about the socio-economic background as an avenue to a seemingly really banal question, but I will try to phrase it in a more profound way, which is the question of uh, elitism. And so can we treat socio-economic background as one of these identity traits, as if like biodiversity we also include people from, I don't know, like lower economic backgrounds, because I'm wondering, related to that, how I would like to phrase this question is, do you think that uh, this liberalized education that you just proposed um, should and could be applied to the whole of society as a general education model, or is it meant to be specifically just for a smaller group of people? Because many of the 13 points mentioned is actually uh, already suggestive of, uh, or are actually already suggestive of this limitation that it cannot be a systemic model. So I'm wondering what's your um, take on that. And then just one more thing to add to this question is, aren't also well, you know, we were talking about the the sham needs, and when we talk about, so if we do want to apply this to a whole generic societal level, there are sham needs that need to be fulfilled. How do we deal with this as liberal arts? Educational lists. I don't even know. Question. Um, yeah. I mean, I think. Was somebody in the audience want to take take this on? No, there was just a question. No, sorry, I just didn't remember the The sham needs. That's me. I I I disown the sham needs, by the way. Some person. I mean, I think that it used to be the case that liberal education in the United States had a certain kind of prestige, broadly, more broadly, cultural prestige, so that the students who were in it were given a kind of moratorium to not think about their careers while they were there. And it was understood by employers that somehow a student who had Come out, came out of there studying dance and philosophy was worth hiring. Now, these things seem to have been ero eroded very quickly. 
Um, I don't know what the answer to this is. I mean, people try, <coughs> proponents of liberal arts try to show things like, look, philosophy majors actually make a lot of money, and they, they actually are <laughs> useful, and stuff like that. For me, those kinds of arguments are a little like, as a friend of mine puts it, puts it like, like peeing in your pants to keep warm. Like, it feels good temporarily, but down the road you're gonna pay a price for having conceded that. And I would like, I would like to fight a desperate rear guard action. <laughs> I mean, who, who, where do the people of privilege act? What do they actually want their children to study? For example, I, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop with that. But you also asked whether diversity should include socioeconomic diversity. You also asked. Yeah. That seems very reasonable to me. And, you know, like a phrase like dead white male doesn't really capture the experience of, say, like a, like I taught a movie of uh, Charlie Chaplin this past year, who was at one point the most famous person in the world, who came from nothing. Like his father was never there, his mother was committed to an asylum. He was in, he lived in workhouses as a child. He came from nothing. Um, can't call him dead white male, privileged, or whatever. It just doesn't do any justice to like his life, you know. So, so I think, yeah. I think it's a big challenge to persuade someone who doesn't come from an economically privileged background that there's value in a useless education. Like I profoundly recognize that difficulty. I think it's profoundly important. Um, so I, right, so I myself, you know, come from a very, so I'm from New York, and I'm from an area that, you know, more people did not go to university than did. Uh, so I, I, re I recognize that difficulty, and I recognize it as really the most significant and important thing somebody who it involves themselves in, in, in liberal education to do. That's my view, and uh, I don't think it's the view of this institution, but it's my personal view that, yes, the, the, the educational experience requires the retreat that David was describing. I identify with that entirely, but I see that not, I certainly would not say that the liberal arts space itself is a retreat from that surrounding reality. And so I think there's tremendous importance. To me, it would diminish from the value of the space if it wasn't my conviction that the space itself can contribute something to the dysfunctional nature of the contemporary classist society, which it remains, for all its wokeness, it remains classist. And this is a big category, as far as I'm concerned. And perhaps despite everything and very strangely, and I could also be mistaken, of course, my argument is that to, to people who are skeptical of this whole line of thought, is that a liberal arts education is much more anti-classist, -class, it's in its classicism even, it's more anti-classist than a lot of higher education in the United States and Europe, which actually replicates, right, what other people, not me, like to call the neoliberal ideology or something like that. Um, and so that, uh, you know, David's allergy is on hearing it or half hearing it to the peeing in your pants version of trying to justify liberal arts education as conducive to the norms of successful society. Um, my version of that or my, my way of saying something that maybe rhymes with it that's a little bit different is that the point in that discourse of insisting on the importance of this as an education for everyone um, is that the only way to resist the logic of the market is to resist the logic of the market. Um, and so this education can do that by saying there is a value other than use and there is a value other than your lifetime earnings potential. Um, can I just ask you what you think of the of the responses? Can we make a little discussional gesture? To yeah, yeah, of course. No, I'm just wondering that. Well, I myself am sitting in a liberal arts institution, so it's it's also 
good to recognize, I guess, where we are making this critique from. And, and I totally, like, I see the value in all the 13 points you made and, uh, well, the, pro the two proposals which we are exercising in this institution. And I'm just wondering, by the, like, by us being allowed to make such a systemic critique because of the distance, because of this retreat, like, what's our responsibility in actually making a systemic critique? Um, and this is where my question came from. And like, yeah, and it's not necessarily like, I also really hate these discussions of like the monetary use of this education. Like whenever someone asks me like, what am I gonna do with this degree? I just refuse to even go into this discussion because I think it's irrelevant. It's just, so it's, I'm just trying to take a step forward. It's not like, because even this idea of success is very much rooted mm -hmm. in something we are critiquing, I guess. Or, mm -hmm. I, mean, I guess I would say, like, very practically, it's probably true that, um, you know, if, you're, if, you, if your liberal education is costing you a mountain of debt, like, you can't retreat. Your, your mind is always somewhere outside, a little bit, about outside the education, with that anxiety. And then it can't, it can't work. So, so, very practically speaking, the education needs to cost less. Uh, and how, how can that happen? Um, well, you have to look at why, why have the costs gone up so much? Um, I think there's an answer, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, that, that's the, at the very practical level. I'm conceding something <coughs> huge right here also, yes. There's a lot of people who want to join in on, on this subject. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. and then, then we'll go here. Yes. All the way into that. You said a little bit of a hint about why the costs have gone up. No idea. <laughs> oh, <laughs> stop recording. Stop recording. Administrators. Yeah. Administration has exploded all, all across all higher education institutions. Oh, and about why? But why? I don't. That that's another discussion. But that's what cost is. Um, so just to sort of continue with what, what you said um, about. And, and then also to go to your, I think your last slide about the um, core curriculum. So if you mentioned that, that you think it's necessary and sufficient to have a, a group of people working together basically over a period of time, um, because then like their background knowledge, their foundational knowledge is the same. And so I was wondering, if, if that's my correct right, yeah, yeah. So I was wondering in, in terms of applying this to sort of a, a philosophy of lifelong education and continuing the liberal arts through one's life. Like, you can't always continue to be with the same group of people, and I understand why there's an appeal of having a same foundation, but at the same time, I think it would be more interesting and more insightful, possibly, to if you plan on continuing that sort of salon-style discussion or where you talk about a piece of writing or a piece of art, um, to have multiple... Um, yeah, perspectives and to have different groups of people with different backgrounds. So I was wondering what your take on that is, um, just in a lifelong sense, and not having the same foundation. I appreciate. I mean, right. I mean, that, it's an empirical question. By the way, I would just, the one thing I would say is not exactly background knowledge, and I I make this small quibble only for the sake of saying that it's about. I wanted to emphasize something that David also emphasized, which is this idea of um, solidarity and individuation, that I don't think it's actually possible. It's much more about psychological states than it is about um, objects of knowledge. So that, and, this is, and, and this would be why the contents of a core curriculum, to me, they matter a lot. Don't get me wrong. Like I've spent hours arguing about the contents of the syllabi for our six core courses. And I don't consider it time wasted, and um, and I'd be willing to spend more hours still having the same arguments over and over about how the hell is it that we don't read Aristotle for even one day in our how is it, David, that we don't read any Aristotle anyway? But you know, so it matters. But what really matters is the fact that, mm, and then your your counterpoint is a serious one, and, and I would you know sort of send it back to our students and other visiting students, you know, my, my sense is, from sitting in seminars, with sometimes the same, it's never, of course, the same 11 people. That, that would not be good if it was literally the same 
Like, Maria had that, actually, where it was like the same eight people. And that wasn't always so great. But we've grown a bit since then, so it's almost never the case anymore that over six, eight semesters, it's the same eight people, but it's in groups of two or three or six out of 11 or 9 or 13, the same people. And that does matter. And for these four years, this goes back to the retreat. The education, in my mind, is not a retreat from the world. So I try all the time, this is, you know, maybe there's a tension here between us too, that the education as it's ongoing and we enter into and out of it, I'm, I'm, the, the education is a world in this sense. The education, I'm, I'm reifying the education that we're engaging in in the college. And it itself is not a retreat from the world in my estimation, but our engagement in it is a retreat from the world. And that, that magic, which was also on your list of why it has to be a residential college, the sentence in Aristotle, that friendship, requires living together for much, <laughs> living together for much <laughs> time, but, you know, but, but to a great extent also, obviously, and you know, as the proverb has it, sharing much salt and so on. Um, right, there's a kind of intellectual friendship in the seminar, and that doesn't get replicated later, you're right. But the point of the, this space, the education, is not to model. That's where we just, you know, you're, you're, you're laying out a, a model that, that is often advocated and is the grounds of Erasmus exchanges, for instance, among other things, that it's good to circulate as much as possible and for, to never sit in the same class with other people. And, to, and I just disagree, I mean, that's so frankly. So you're right, that, that, that's a thought, and maybe that's true, and this thought can't be true at the same time. But the, the, the argument for this thought wouldn't be because there's some stuff you absolutely have to know, so we have to keep you here on this campus learning from us because we know, but rather we have to preserve this space that we have in common because only in that way does the conversation actually ever begin. It's not that it continues. It's that in general in seminars, there's never a conversation. Are you all the way in the back, Justin Hanson? And, and Danny also? Right in front has a hand up. Danny in the middle. And the um, yeah, so I guess I'm formulating the question as I speak it, so, so bear with me. But um, when you, David, mentioned this place outside of space as kind of breaking from the matrix of the everyday and, and experiencing different states of being, wearing how different thoughts feel, um, and presenting as a kind of retreat from the world, I was wondering if there is a kind of contradiction or maybe like just a question raised there because a retreat from the world also exists spatially like to an extent and so and it's also it doesn't come as a black like blank canvas it's um, like how is it orchestrated this retreat because the form that it takes the kind of readings that we do the experiences that are suggested are so formative and so how does that retreat come into conversation with um, the kind of questions we will ask and the kind of in engagements we will have with the material. So, because um, talking about the core in this context, um, and I know, Michael, you might not believe this, but I actually really like the core and I think it's really important. <laughs> uh, I have some specific um, criticism of it, but um, in the sense of if experiencing different states of being and s different thoughts is, is a part of it, then the question of diversity maybe is not only a political one, but a, a question about what kind of epistemes are we connecting to and what kind, if, if to diversify doesn't also mean to broaden the types of experiences of the world. And so it's not only a question of the politically correct or a kind of uh, the, the political question, but about broadening like the very scope of knowledge in this context, mm -hmm. if that was at all clear. Yeah. Broadening it so, sounds like maybe you have something in mind. Can you, can you give me an example? How? Or how? Well, um, so I think like one of the criticisms I do have about the core is is that of course um, it's very much centered uh, around Europe uh, and European forms of knowledge, uh, and I think um, it doesn't mean that it should be all post-colonial cores. But I think isn't there something that we're losing? if our lens of experiencing this core, and it's the only thing that every student at this university will have, is only through these eyes. Yeah. So talking about indigenous epistemologies, talking about 
uh, different forms of experiencing and, and thinking and uh, I, I think it can be reductive it, it, as an intellectual exercise to, to focus only on that and I know that Europe has many faces and it's multiple yeah. but if, it is, if there isn't something that we're losing in the process of that. Uh, sure, yes. Um, the question then is a, <coughs> what you there's lots of questions then. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, one thing, one thing that I think is probably true is that, I mean, we could change. Does anybody really know anything about the Middle, middle Ages of Europe? In this room, <laughs> and you're like, before you take a class, the Middle Ages is really bizarre. Like, I don't think in some way that it is us. So, if what one wants to experience is something different, an alien, you could pick that, or something. Something else, I kind of think. But you could pick something else. But then there's a practical question. There's, a, there's something of a practical question, which is who? Are, who? One practical question is who are your faculty? Um, what kind of expertise do you need them to have in order to be able to represent yourself to the rest of the academic world as doing something serious? Some of my colleagues. Like, could I, could I run a class on, on Japanese literature? I would love to, but I think that my dean would tell me I can't. Um, and she might be right. Uh, so, there's a, so unless you want to hire a huge new group of people, which you could say, but I do, you know, but then you need money and other things, you know. It was hard. It's actually practically very hard, even though for sure you're right that there's value out there. It has to be. Right. I don't know if I'm giving you an answer that's satisfying, yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah, it's just that since you placed it as like different from our experience, I think there's already the separation of like us and like not coming from an European background. I think that's also sometimes I feel like how the, the way it's framed, it's like it's the them to an extent and so uh, maybe that's also where, where the question lies, but, but I, I understand what you're saying, and maybe... Uh, so, so you do think that the, the reason why it's not, it's a limitation of the kind of backgrounds that the faculty has. That's one reason. I think there are, there are other things to, to say and discuss, such mm -hmm. as, if you did do something like run from Greece to the Middle Ages, to the Renaissance, to early modern science, and if you did draw something of a European circle around that, what you would emerge with is some, is some kind of a of an interesting large story that might be of value. Um, and you would lose that uh, if you broke it. But maybe you would gain something of more value. This is a discussion you'd have to have. Um, I don't know, Michael. Time, you, yeah. time seems to be getting a little bit short. Maybe we should collect a couple. Glenn in the front here has been trying for a long time. And uh, there's the hands in the back. So maybe we'll just take these two and then keep taking more. I have a question that oh. I hope will link together two questions that I have in the state of post. Uh, because I think, if I remember correctly, you quoted Arendt uh, uh, that said something about dismantling the fantasy of objectivity of natural sciences. Yes. But then, uh, then you went on to distinguishing sham needs and true needs. That's, uh, and given that, I've been wondering whether those true needs are drew, true because they are objective, Mm -hmm. Given that we, we are talking about dismantling that, uh, that fantasy, or they are true because they are subjective, or they are true because the deadest man, white male said so. Right. Could you have elaborate on that, please? Okay. Let's collect this. Can we take your first two? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm on for you. Okay, yeah. I'm just a little worried about the articulation of the, the core modules in terms of the constitution of a common sense, mm -hmm. especially if and I don't know this because I'm not a student here, it's framed in especially European terms. Mm -hmm. Is it not then more of a, an extinguishing of difference than a construction of a shared space? Is it not rather an expulsion of certain differences which are deemed irreconcilable, irreconcilable in favor of, a, let's cultivate personalities for this one? Mm -hmm. that, that would be my main worry off the, the back of a lot of these questions. I think, I mean, I'm happy to say something to be, and not give the floor to David this time. No, but, um, 
No, so I really appreciate the question. I would, I think the three questions articulate. So I'll start with the question about uh, objectivity because thank you for asking that. I don't, I now feel like I didn't read out my main quote which started with the word impartiality. How did I skip it? I like skipped it all together. I skipped Homer, David. Did you notice that? How did that happen? I guess it was there on slide 2-2. Two, two. But anyway, I'll share. The, the answer to this question is that for Arendt, truth, there is such a thing as truth. And this is the answer to these two questions. From Arendt, and I might even identify, is that there is something like truth. But it's not objective. Okay? It's not objective. There's no such thing as objectivity. What it is is impartial. And imp it just so happens, this is our end, and fuck it, also, sorry, I'll sign <laughs> on to this today, all right? Our poor curriculum begins with Homer's Iliad because impartiality, because she's right about this, because impartiality began with Homer's Iliad. Can you expand? <laughs> I mean, this is something that we often talk about in our core, core course. Impartiality is not objectivity. Okay? Impartiality is the capacity to enter into a world that is held in common, which is not the world that you happen to be born into because of chance and necessity, because of the ever, you know, the Heraclitian, you know, always the same, always changing, live in that conundrum for a while, but right, always the same, always changing flux of chance and necessity, which look like they're opposed, but are actually two sides of the same coin. And of course, we miss a lot by not diving into all, to, to every possible extent, which of course would be very limited because we're only human and because we have our linguistic limitations and for other reasons, but we lose something and we miss something by consciously limiting ourselves to a certain tradition and not to others. But Arendt would say, and for now I'll co-sign, and we can continue to argue about it, um, it's only by consigning yourself to that tradition that you're capable of entering a common world. We have an illusion, and I'm sympathetic to it, but I dissent from it. We have an illusion that by being the most open we could possibly be to every, I hear this in your comments, Right, which is the most open we could be, and by having the most representative curriculum we could imagine, we will develop, I'm not saying that was your point, but that's a way this case gets made, um, we'll have, we'll be the most open and plural persons that we can be. What I, in my experience, what it seems to me over, you know, it's now almost 27 years in higher education, because I've never left, right, I entered higher education and never left, what I've seen in my colleague, my fellow students who went on and did different kinds of programs and teach in high schools and teach in colleges, some of them went and got grad, right, is this ever-increasing indoctrination in a sense of pluralist, open education that is empty, that doesn't ultimately communicate anything valuable to the people who are engaging in it. And I don't think the answer to that is to keep shouting the same um, curriculum that would have been devised, that was devised in the 19th century or in the mid 20th century in certain institutions, to of course continue adapting what we read, but to recognize that our institution, it no longer calls itself the European College of Liberal Arts, but our institution is a European College of Liberal Arts. Not only because it's in Berlin, but because, and now I'm going to contradict to some extent what I said before, but because our core curriculum is a, a core curriculum that's based on the history of European ideas. It is that. And I think we have to own that. It's uncomfortable to own it, but we have to own that that's what this is. And like your 13th point, I think it was, these, Europe, these liberal arts institutions ought not to be identical. Yeah. There ought to be as many of these as humanly possible, and we ought to visit each other for one semester here and there. But, you know, they should have their own identity. Um, and, and inside that space that they create, young human beings should enter into a world held, held in common within that limited protected space. Because the alternative to that is no world as far as I can see, and that's what most educational institutions in the world are purveying. 
Do you want to know? All right. Um, maybe this is a, a weird question or a terrible question. Uh, maybe both. Uh, but anyway, it came from your lecture, Michael, but I think uh, it's also relevant for what David was talking about. And uh, I, I thought that uh, perhaps the attempt was to respond to, or uh, at least one of the lectures was more clearly attempting to respond to, while the other was more identifiably dealing with the notion of a certain disenchantment of the world. Uh, now, if this is a result of modernity or, or a culture or a civilization that values an idea of thought, a certain conception of thought, including rational thought perhaps, uh, there could as easily be the argument made that we need to go further down the road of this disenchantment. Um, so is the project of liberal arts or liberal education a project of a certain re-enchantment of the world? Or is it a parsing through of scattered elements, categories, or concepts within the world that we encounter or come across? Or has it actually played an active role in this disenchantment, which should then be valued, actually? Um, and, yeah, yeah, basically. Sorry, there's a comment over here. Yeah, I have a question to both of you. Do you consider your vision of education sustainable? <laughs> <laughs> if only you'd been here 10 years ago, you would know why the answer is yes. I, I want to comment to Daniel and also to my previous question. I think it's fair for you to say that the liberal arts education here should own the fact that it's European, but also then the people who are coming as outsiders should, should as I experienced was, what happened when you read a European text and through the difference the response that you build is the personhood that takes place. Mm -hmm. So this is to say that the dead white male has an important role because of the difference that, that, that generates that response. And now I'm thinking, Michael, of Carlos Frankel's teaching mm -hmm. Plato in Palestine, that there was so much conversation that you could do while you're reading the deadest white male for <laughs> conflict resolution and for cross-cultural conversation. And while it should not be just that, but I think these texts can generate that. So I think even coming from a, an outside, should not, we, should not even, we should not be ashamed of the fact that we have to now identify to a text or not identify to a text, but really being open to that. And that is why my problem with the latest progressive education which Guardian is proposing, and Cambridge is constantly on board with that, that the white man should go from the literature, literature faculty because it has no purpose left. And I find that deeply, deeply problematic because I think it can serve so much more purpose. It was not a question, sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to bring up what I hope to a lot of people is a fairly obvious sentiment that sure for, for Bard, formally, more explicitly European in title, it makes some deal of sense for it to own up to the fact that it's a European establishment. But there are many fairly obvious and pretty horrific reasons why there are so many more European liberal arts colleges than mm. non-European. I think part of owning up to the idea of being a European institution is to own up to the immense violence in still positing a Europeanness to liberal arts education. And that's not to say fire everyone and hire only post colonial theorists. Although but post colonial maybe, theory is a profoundly European phenomenon. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, that's, that's the, the you know, so, but, yeah. so we just, we all have to own up. It, we, we have to own up to that. Um, I, it's so funny, like, I feel like for people who don't know me at all, I'm coming across as, I'm on completely the opposite side of the argument in almost every, like, conversation I find myself among friends. But I'm happy to inhabit the space for today because both sides of this argument, the so-called culture wars that we've been waging amongst ourselves for no particularly good reason for all of my mature life, um, you know, they're both a European phenomenon. I mean, the, the argument itself is a European phenomenon. It's a legacy of European universalism, the European attempt to, uh, to, to dominate the globe. Um, but it doesn't change the fact that the category, so the issue I think that's at stake is if we have, and we may not, 
But you know, if we have a sense of the value of a common world across tremendous differences, that's an idea that becomes thinkable within the space that is also the space that the project of global domination and the world system and global capitalism also becomes possible. So these things are not, unfor maybe unfortunately, right? So that's the violence, I think, that you're describing. I think it is necessary to own up to that, but then the owning up to that idea doesn't invalidate the idea that cross-cultural understanding, as we understand it, with all of its faults still, is an idea that emanates out of a certain tradition. And that in order to really understand how we understand culture or understanding or cross-cultural understanding, we have to understand that tradition. That's a, that's a compelling norm for us, I think, whatever social, political, epistemological perspectives we end up taking. I guess that's the thing that I wanted more to say. There's a lot in what Arendt argues in particular I would not identify with. But I would undersign enough of her argument to say that the retreat from owning the Europeanness of our thought tradition is, 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 is ultimately a dead end. That's what's unsustainable to me. And that identifying the European tradition as the roots of one's educational project doesn't doom one to um, irrelevance because it means repeating the same things that were said for the 2,000 years that the because the, the tradition was really invented in the 19th century, not earlier. But you know, it's, it's sorry, to, sorry, it's 4:32, and my yeah. son is probably gonna. Not